Our topic today is Function Matters, how to determine why a student demonstrates problem behavior. As a part of this presentation, we will also review how to take that information toward the development of a positive behavior support plan. My name is Carol Schall, and I am the Director of the Technical Assistance Division at the Virginia Commonwealth University Autism Center for Excellence. When we're completing an FBA, it's important to understand that we are assessing the function of challenging behavior. We are not assessing um, the student's functioning level or the individual's abilities. In this case, what we're looking at is how does the individual's behavior occur in the context of their social and physical environment. It's important to note at this point, before we start into the process, that this is an evidence-based practice that is appropriate for all ages of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. I have on the next few fly slides a few citations from the literature. The literature is strongest for elementary age students with ASD. Nevertheless, this is an appropriate an evidence-based strategy to use across all disability types and all ages. In fact, um, Dr. Carr in 1999 with his colleagues completed a meta-analysis of functional behavior assessment that demonstrated the strength of this procedure and how useful it is for all students with disabilities across all ages. The salient features of an FBA include the definition of the behavior that is most challenging. This is an important aspect. Um, as we work through the process, we will take a moment to really talk about how we define behavior. We want to avoid generic terms that don't really define what is happening at the time that the problem behavior is occurring. Additionally, our findings will be based on two different types of assessment indirect assessment where we interview those closest to the behavior and direct assessment where we observe the behavior in the context in which it occurs. We're going to work from use the place of using a hypothesis when we're concluding our assessment. This hypothesis, as all hypotheses, are a scientific guess based on our observation and our assessment material. Finally, we will plug this assessment information into a competing behavior model and that will be the bridge that takes us from assessment to positive behavior support planning. As we look at the functions of behavior, we have to begin understanding our assumptions. Our first assumption, and probably our most important assumption, is that behavior, whether it's challenging or not, serves a function for that person in that environment. Also, the individual is using the behavior at the particular time because it works well to assist them in accomplishing that function. This is true of all of our behavior. Some of you may have engaged in challenging your behavior yourselves at a, um, one time or another. For exa ex example, many people will sometimes exceed the speed limit when they're driving. That behavior is a problem because when you're exceeding the speed limit, you're putting others at risk in the area where you're driving. When you think about your own function, your own reasons for displaying that problem behavior, what you'll discover is that there are reasons for you to speed. Sometimes those reasons might be personal. It just feels good to go fast. At other times, there might be very tangible reasons. For example, you have to get somewhere and you want to be on time. Those be, that challenge be, challenging behavior serves a function for you at the time that it's occurring. Therefore, our behavior is influenced by the antecedents that precede the behavior and the consequences that occur after the behavior. In fact, those antecedents and consequences really influence the repeat of the behavior. And therefore, when we're looking at problem behavior and we're completing a functional behavior assessment, we have to keep in mind that we are looking at and, and exploring those antecedents and consequences. Finally, there are four functions. Now, when I say that, there's, that behavior serves a function, one of the things you may be thinking currently is, Gosh, behavior is communicating constantly and there are millions of things that any one behavior could, could communicate. 
In fact, these, these functions narrow down to four, and they are attention. Individuals who use challenging behavior sometimes do so to seek attention from those they want. Escape. Sometimes individuals who are displaying challenging behavior are displaying that behavior to escape an unpleasant situation. In fact, those first two, attention and escape, account for much of the problem behavior that you will see in a school setting. They also account for behavior that you might see at a work setting. A third function of behavior is tangible. This is the classic two-year-old tantrum in the grocery store. When the two-year-old throws themselves to the floor and cries and screams and whines to attempt to get behavior, the, uh, excuse me, to attempt to get candy, they are seeking a particular tangible outcome and their behavior serves a purpose to assist them in getting that outcome. This function occurs less in school because the tangible reinforcement that's available to students is frequently scheduled into the day. For example, lunchtime is a time when students can get access to tangible items. It does, however, occur when it comes to reward times, when students display um, tantruming behavior, crying, screaming, yelling, kicking, in order to get access to a computer. That might be considered a tangibly motivated problem behavior. The final function is a sensory function. This is a rare function. We see it very rarely in school. It sometimes does occur, particularly with self-stimulatory behavior. If a behavior is self-stimulatory in nature, and therefore the person is receiving sensory feedback, we would only intervene if that behavior interferes with that person's success in the current environment or becomes dangerous to the person or those around them. Most self-stimulatory behavior does not rise to that category and so unless it's really disruptive or really dangerous to the person or others around them, we frequently don't address self-stimulatory or sensory behavior. Once you've identified the function of the problem behavior, you will use the competing behavior model to plug that information in and assist you in identifying the new behaviors that you will teach to replace the problem behavior. You'll notice on the chart before you that the antecedent is in the purple box. That antecedent will remain the same throughout your assessment and your intervention phase. You'll plug in the information you collected about the function of the behavior in the red boxes. You'll identify the problem behavior, and then you'll identify the function of that behavior next to the problem behavior. In order to help you plan efficiently, you'll then move to the yellow boxes, where you'll identify a replacement behavior. When you first identify that replacement behavior, you want to make sure that it serves the same function that the problem behavior previously served. In, imagine that a student was displaying um, a challenging behavior to avoid or escape a task. A reasonable replacement behavior that serves the same function would be to request another task or request a break at the moment that a problem task is presented. Now that replacement behavior serves the same function in that the student learns that they can acquire a break and avoid tasks by asking for a break. That may not be your final goal, however. So you may have a desired behavior in the green boxes at the bottom of the screen that you'd really like the person to demonstrate. In the case of task avoidance, it might be that you want that student to attempt a difficult task in order to learn new skills. You cannot teach the student to attempt until they learn to trust you by asking for a break. And so the third, the third aspect of our chart, the second behavior that you'll teach, is attempting a task. In order to make this palatable, you may have to enhance the reinforcement associated with attempting difficult tasks. For a student who displays challenging behavior, they may need some additional reinforcement early on when attempting a new task. The next few slides demonstrate a, a number of the articles and a number of the um, research-based um, 
information available on the topic of functional behavior assessment. And so I'll just page through these various articles very quickly. If you'd like copies of these articles, you can search them through a university library and you, you will, will be able to access these articles on your handout after this presentation. As you can see through the, inter through the articles um, listed on the screens, there is a lot more information on FBA for elementary age students. As I noted earlier, however, this is a practice that is evidence-based across the age range, even though there isn't as much literature in the later ages. The next section of this webcast will demonstrate how to complete an, a functional behavior assessment using a case study approach. The steps for completing a functional behavior assessment are before you on the screen right now. They include defining the behavior, indirect assessment, which is interviewing the team members and the stakeholders who have the most knowledge about the problem behavior. You always include in a direct assessment. Direct assessment is an observation in the environment where the behavior occurs. You cannot complete a functional behavior assessment without directly observing the behaviors. There has been some research that suggests that interviews alone are incorrect in the identification of the function of the behavior between 50 to 75 percent of the time. The purpose of the interview is to get a very clear picture of what's occurring and to assist you in identifying where you must observe in order to see the problem behavior. Without observation, you have not completed a functional behavior assessment. You may be able to meet with a team and summarize your findings. However, you will not be able to meet with a team simply to complete a functional behavior assessment without having direct observation data. And I will show you how we collect direct observation data in a moment. Finally, you will develop a hypothesis and test that hypothesis. A hypothesis, scientifically speaking, is an educated guess. This hypothesis is based on your interviews with team members and your observation in the environment in which the behavior occurs. But a hypothesis is not a confirmed actual theorem. And so therefore, once you've developed a hypothesis, it's important in the FBA process to take a moment and test your findings to confirm that what you've learned about the behavior holds. The first step, as I mentioned, is identifying the behavior. And that may seem simple on the surface. However, we want to make sure that we have a very clear definition of that problem behavior. There are a number of tests that are important to subject your behavioral definition to in order to assure that you have a sound definition of the problem behavior. The first test is the count test. This test simply asks you to consider whether or not you can count the behavior as it's described. Using this test, it's important for me to note that if you have a behavior such as tantrum, it's going to be difficult to count it because not all team members will have the same definition of tantrum. Additionally, in order to be able to count a behavior, you must know when it begins and when it ends. Using a term like tantrum makes it difficult for you to identify exactly, precisely when a behavior begins and ends. Compare that word tantrum to a definition where you might describe a tantrum as screaming and yelling I want repeatedly in the grocery store. It's going to be difficult for me to count tantrum, but if, I, if my definition is screaming and yelling, quote, I want in the middle of a grocery store, I can certainly count when that behavior begins and ends because I can identify exactly, precisely what the behavior is and where it occurs. Therefore, the count test is our first and most important test. And again, that test exists to make sure that we're able to measure the behavior that we're concerned about. 
The next test is the charades or stranger test. This test requires that we consider our definition and ask ourselves, would a stranger be able to identify the behavior based on our definition? Earlier, I used the term screaming and yelling. Well, what I think of as screaming and yelling may not be clear to everyone. And so I might want to qualify that with the quote, I want, I want cereal, I want candy. And so when I qualify the words screaming and yelling with a quote, it helps the stranger understand exactly what behavior we're talking about. I use the charades test as well to describe this same um, aspect of behavioral definition. And this is because I want the, um, the people reading about the behavior to be able to demonstrate it. So could they pick up this definition and act that behavior out in a game of charades? That's what the charades test is. The third test is the potato test. If a potato can do, can display the behavior, it is not a behavior. And so using the potatoes test, consider um, lying still without moving. Well, a potato can lie still and not move. Therefore, that's not really a behavior. Behaviors involve the movement of muscles and the movement of glands. And so if a person is, is being, quote, noncompliant, again, that's not a behavior, but that's a description, noncompliant, that is not, um, that does not pass the count test, the charades test, or the potato test. We want to describe that behavior in much, much more detail. So I have a description at the bottom of the screen where we have noncompliant, lazy, or refuses to work. I can put a potato on this table and tell it to do something and it would refuse to work. So this first description is not a behavioral description. The second one, the sub-bullet, sits with head down when manded or directed to begin work is a, um, does pass the count test, the charades test, and the potato test. Sits with head down on the desk when manded or directed to begin work. That is a behavioral description that passes the count test, the charades or strangers test, and the potato test. The final test is the so what test. So what if someone sits with their head down when they're mandated to work? Maybe the work is stupid. Maybe they're not feeling well. There are circumstances where that would be an appropriate response. The so what test, however, challenges us to consider is this behavior really disruptive and impactful in that student's educational program? If the student always responds to all work by putting their heads down when, when mandated to direct uh, or when mandated or directed to begin work, then that person does need a behavioral intervention because they're not able to learn. And so the so what task, test asks us, is this behavior severe enough to warrant intervention? Is this behavior disruptive? Is this behavior a, a risk to the person themselves or others, and a risk in that it might cause harm? And then finally, might this behavior result in a change in placement if the person doesn't cease doing the behavior? There are behaviors that are not terribly severe on their face, but when we consider their impact to the person, they become much more severe. Um, I once worked with a team that described a problem behavior where an individual took the heel of their hand and hit a book three times before turning a page. And when I inquired about, the, and, and they wanted to change this behavior, they wanted to know what should we do to stop this behavior. Well, my first question was, does, can I count the behavior? And in fact, it's a very clear description. Take the heel of my hand and bang it al along a page of a book three times. I could count it. I could act it out. Strangers who looked at that could identify that behavior. It passed the potato test. A potato doesn't have a hand, can't take that heel and move it, uh, of the hand and move it up and down. The test that it, I was not sure about for this behavior was the so what test. So what if he takes his hand and hits a page three times before he turns the page? How impactful is that behavior? And so I said to the team, how often does this occur? 
and they informed me every time he turns a page, he hits it three times with the heel of his hand. And I said, well, how long does he take to do this behavior? Is he hitting it very slowly so that it takes him, you know, a minute to two minutes to turn a page? And they said, no, it's very quick. One, two, three, he's done and he turns the page. And then I said, well, does it happen so often that he can't keep up with class? And they said, no, he's a very bright young man with autism. And as long as he gets his one, two, three in, he can keep up. My final qu question for them with the so what test was, how long on the very worst day when this behavior occurs, how long does it take him if you add up all of the times that he hits his hand on the desk across the entire day? And they said, well, total, it's probably about five minutes of his entire day. At that point, I determined that although this behavior passed the first three tests, it did not pass the so what test. So what if he spends five minutes out of his entire school day hitting his hand on the book? It's just an odd or eccentric behavior that doesn't really impact his life and doesn't lead to him not being able to learn. And so that behavior was not considered a behavior for intervention because it didn't pass the so what test. These tests are very important when we consider what are the behaviors that are most important for us to intervene. If you think about how difficult it is to change your own behavior, and if you think about a child or a young person in school, and consider that you probably can only change maybe two, at most three behaviors in any one school year. Making sure that we select those behaviors carefully is an important aspect of our work. When we're identifying the behavior, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to have a very clear behavioral definition. In order to help you do that, I have two examples of how you might go about describing or explaining a behavior. This first example is tantrum. And the tool that I'm using here is a dichotomous description or a T-square. On one side of the screen you'll see I have the words looks like. On the right side of the screen you'll see I have the words sounds like. When you're defining a behavior you want to make sure that you understand exactly and precisely what the behavior looks like and sounds like when it's occurring. And so for this behavior tantrum, I'm going to demonstrate how you might describe what it looks like and sounds like. For this behavior, for this particular person, a tantrum looks like the person on the floor, flailing arms and legs, grabbing at desired objects or items, hitting others who come within two feet, and staying on the floor. This description is much more precise and behaviorally oriented than the first word tantrum. Now that alone may not be enough because that could be a game that the person is playing, pretending to swim. And so we add in the sounds like feature as well. This behavior tantrum for this individual sounds like crying, screaming, saying I want, saying no, or roaring. You can see by having looks like and sounds like together, we have a precise behavioral definition of tantrum. And so this is a very helpful tool. When you're sitting with a team at that first step and you're interviewing that team to identify the behavior, this is a very good way to go about it using the looks like and sounds like definition method. The second method is one that I used with an individual who described her behavior, she, she was coming to me privately, and she described her behavior as hyper. And so what we did was we used this word webbing technique. This is a technique that's frequently used in English classes to assist students who are writing a paper on a topic to begin to organize their thoughts about what they might want to say. In this case, the individual that I was working with described their behavior as hyper. I was not clear about what she meant when she said, I feel hyper. And so I said, tell me what hyper means to you. And she said, well, I ask repeated questions over and over again. I scratch at my eyes and my wrists out of habit. I can't move when I'm hyper because I'm just too focused on finding out the answers to my questions. I cry a lot. I stare at others. And I won't listen or move. 
Now, out of those, I understood repeated questions, scratching at eyes and wrists, refusing to move, staring at others, and crying. But I needed clarification on just won't listen or move. And so I said, what do you do when you're not listening or moving? She said, I sit with my head in my hands, and I don't respond when other people talk to me. This method, word webbing, helped me with this less understandable um, behavior, hyper. And it helped me understand what she was talking about. Given this um, web, I was also able to begin to target the specific behaviors that passed the so what test as well. So you can see, I can count sitting with head in hands, crying, asking repeated questions, scratching at eyes and wrists, and staring. I can count those behaviors. They pass the potato test. They pass the charades test. But now I have to apply the so what test to each of these behaviors. Well, you could say crying doesn't pass the so what test because it's not particularly impactful. A lot of people cry and it's a common human experience. In fact, it may be a helpful behavior when you're trying to demonstrate that you're having a difficult time. Asking questions might not pass the so what test because that's a good thing to do. But scratching eyes and wrists presents a point of harm for this person. And so that's a behavior that passes the so what test. So when we talk about hyper, we want to be clear about the exact behaviors that we're talking about. In order to demonstrate this, I have a case study. Um, Andrew is a 16-year-old young man with autism, and also he has some in intellectual disabilities. Andrew, at the age of 16, is not using words to, to communicate at this point, but he is using a combination of sign language and pictures. Um, he receives his academics in a special education setting um, where he is in a self-contained classroom. However, he goes to electives with his peers. So he attends music, art, physical education, and um, computer with his general education peers. Andrew d it, it displays a behavior that his special education teacher describes as attention seeking. Now that behavior, attention seeking, does not pass the so what test, the stranger test, the uh, charades test, the potato test, or the count test, because I have no clue at this point in the case what that behavior looks like or, or sounds like. So I clearly have to meet with his team and get more information. The interesting aspect of Andrew's behavior is that he doesn't seem to display this behavior in general education settings. It only appears to occur in his special education classroom. The first step in completing a functional behavior assessment on Andrew's behavior is to define the behavior and to begin to collect informal and formal data about the conditions under which this behavior occurs. Now that means that I'm going to have to sit down with his teacher, his instructional assistants, some of his general education teachers, and learn more about Andrew as well as his problem behavior. And so I ask you to consider at this point in the webcast what questions you might have about attention-seeking behavior. I want you to keep in mind that sometimes when you ask questions of people who are coming to you for help, they might take offense at the way you're phrasing the questions. And so you have to be careful with that. In order to help you with this task, I have listed 10 questions that were originally published in a wonderful little booklet called Assessing Problem Behaviors by Demchek and Bossert. This um, publication may still be available through the um, what was then referred to as the American Association on Mental Retardation in their Research to Practice series. It is now, that organization is now referred to as the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Um, and so if you're searching for this title, you would have to look um, under their new website. Um, as you look at these questions, though, these 10 questions are fairly good questions that would help you identify some more information about this, quote, attention-seeking behavior. And so I've published these questions citing where they come from for your, um, for your help. The interview questions that they've included in, um, include the two on the screen before you right now. 
For each problem behavior, specify the activities or settings in which the behavior typically occurs. In Andrew's case, the teacher was not particularly clear on the activities. She described that it, it happened at various times across the school day in the special education cl classroom, but it did not happen in the general education classroom. And so you have some idea about the settings, but you're not clear on the activities at this point. Um, also, there was not a particular notation about time of day, except that um, they did not, the behavior did not occur in, in general education classrooms. The second question, um, what typically happens when the behavior occurs? The teacher described that she had to clean up because Andrew frequently threw things, so she had, to, she had him help her pick up. Um, she also said that she redirected him to work, that she continually asked him to come to work when he was displaying this, quote, attention-seeking behavior, and that she sometimes used visual supports to cue him and prompt him. She did not note that there were particular events that always or frequently occurred before the behavior occurred, but she did note that they seemed to occur more often when she asked Andrew to do um, particular tasks in the classroom. She said that if she wanted to have a good day with Andrew with no problem behavior at all, she would never ask him to do any work in the classroom. Um, she said again that um, if she let Andrew do whatever he wanted, he would not display these problem behaviors. And um, she also noted that she had to be with him pretty frequently. And so in order to um, avoid the problem behavior occurring, it took a lot of intensive intervention and interaction from his, his teacher as well as letting him do whatever he wanted to do, letting him choose activities in the classroom. She said she wasn't sure, in reference to question number six, whether or not Andrew was communicating with his behavior, except that he required a lot of attention. She also noted that Andrew had a seizure disorder. However, um, the behavior occurred less often when he was feel feeling ill and um, did not seem to be correlated with seizures in any way. Regarding question eight, she did note that Andrew did have moods and sometimes she could tell the way he came in the classroom that he was going to have a rougher day than others. Um, she also noted that in regards to question nine, that the behavior did seem to be influenced by environmental factors. That if there was someone else in the classroom who was requiring a lot of the teacher's attention, Andrew was more likely to display this problem behavior. Finally, as it relates to question 10, um, she said that she did not know if um, there were outside events that seemed to influence this behavior. At this point in our functional behavior assessment of Andrew's behavior, we understand some facts that might help us understand his behavior, but as you can see, even though we've asked a lot of questions, we don't have enough information to propose a scientifically based hypothesis. And so the next step in our process is to interview Andrew. There are two ways that I find helpful to do this. The first is an ABC or an antecedent behavior consequence chart. Sometimes I collect that ABC data on a chart that specifically shows that. I'll show you an example in a second. At other times, I use the method developed by Dr. Carr and colleagues using note cards. Sometimes I'll hand a teacher a number of note cards and ask that teacher to write down every single specific point and um, piece of data or information about a problem behavior that occurred in a classroom. Sometimes when I get a lot of rich information from the note cards, I'm able to get a better picture of what's happening in the classroom. In Andrew's case, because the teacher didn't have much information about the particular behavior, I went in and observed Andrew in his classroom. On the screen before you now is the antecedent behavior consequence chart that I used to observe Andrew and to try to figure out the function of his behavior. When I entered the classroom, Andrew was playing in a tunnel. Um, he had his teacher's attention. His teacher was interacting with him. 
there was a knock on the door and the teacher left Andrew to answer the door. Now, as you follow this chart across, we're going to move from the left to the right. And what you'll see is I note the antecedent in the far left-hand column. The middle column always has Andrew's behavior, and the right-hand column describes what happened after the behavior occurred. And so, on the far left-hand side, you see the knock on the door, the teacher leaves to answer the door. Next, Andrew runs from the tunnel to the TV in the classroom. The aide, who's also in the classroom, says to Andrew, no TV now, Andrew. The aide then walks over to Andrew. Andrew jumps on a chair near the TV and reaches for the TV. This was a TV that was up in the corner of the classroom. The aide says to Andrew, we don't want you to get hurt. Then the aide helps Andrew down. Andrew runs from the aide, picks up the bean box in the classroom, and dumps it all over the floor. The aide walks to Andrew, gets a broom, and says, now we have to sweep. The aide helps Andrew sweep with hand over hand prompting, actually holding Andrew's hands on the broom and helping him sweep. Andrew sweeps three to four times with hand over hand assistance. The teacher returns to the room, gets, um, gets Andrew while the aide completes the sweeping task. Now, as you look at this behavioral sequence, you can see that there's an escalation from the time that the teacher leaves until the time that the teacher returns. This slide represents probably about three minutes of problem behavior. And so one of the things that I want to tell you about the way we collect data when we're observing is you have to be a very quick writer and you have to be able to capture the details very quickly. As you look at this episode, I could have just described Andrew's behavior. He ran from the tunnel, ran to the TV, dumped the bean box, and then he swept up with assistance. But that wouldn't exactly tell you the function of the behavior. You have to be able to, in order to assess the function of the behavior, look at the antecedents and the consequences. This behavior does appear to serve the function of seeking attention, but we now have a much better definition of the behavior. He runs to the TV, he dumps the bean box, and he sweeps. And so we see that the, the problem behaviors here are the running from the, the, the classroom and dumping the bean box. And so when we look at this behavior in this way, you can see how much more rich data and how much more able we are to assess the function with this kind of data versus a general description. The second behavior that I observed in the classroom was not an attention-seeking behavior. As we read through this one, it will span across two slides, but I want you to notice that this behavior serves a different function. And so by naming the behavior attention-seeking, we may have missed what these behaviors mean. In this case, Andrew is on the floor with the bean box. The teacher says, time to come to work. Come he here, Andrew. The teacher then repeats, computer time, Andrew. Andrew shakes his head no. The teacher says, OK, I'll play the new game. The teacher leaves to play on the computer. Andrew sits at the bean box playing with the beans. The aide takes the bean box from Andrew. The teacher is sitting at the computer, playing on the computer. Andrew is sitting on the floor happily staring off with nothing to do. The teacher gets pictures from the envelope by Andrew's picture schedule and shows Andrew, first computer, then video. Andrew runs from the teacher, bangs on the window, takes his shoes off and throws them, takes his socks off and throws them. The teacher says, get your shoes and socks on and starts hand over hand prompting. The teacher walks away back to the computer Andrew throws the bean box. The teacher walks back to Andrew and says firmly, no. Helps Andrew pick up the beans. The one-on-one -on -one aide arrives from break. Andrew looks up and laughs. The aide finishes the cleanup task with Andrew. The aide gets the first then strip. First play computer, then play. Andrew walks to the computer. The aide provides praise. 
In this case, we have a sequence of behaviors that include just sitting on the floor, shaking head no, playing with the bean box, taking shoes and socks off, throwing them, and then um, throwing the bean box. This cluster of behaviors does not serve to seek attention, however. This cluster of, of behaviors is best described to serve to escape the computer work. And when the, the reinforcer of play is, is shown to Andrew, he then complies with the task because he was seeking to play originally. When the teacher tried to offer him a video, that was not an effective reinforcer for him. So it was worth it to him. He was willing to risk the consequence of his behavior in order to continue to play. And so with Andrew, we have two different sequences of behaviors. One functions to seek attention, the other functions to, to escape a task. So when you look at this question on this next slide, what did Andrew get or avoid that he was willing to pay the cost of his behavior? In the first sequence, he was seeking attention. In the second sequence, he was seeking to avoid work. And so once we understand what he gets or avoids, we can begin to think about how we might respond differently to Andrew in both of those circumstances. We can also begin to ask ourselves, what does Andrew need to learn in order to be more successful in this environment? This is how we format our hypothesis statement. At the point that we've observed Andrew and we have a better idea of the function of his behavior, we can then form our hypothesis statement. Here's a sample hypothesis statement in the box. When Joe is asked to complete a handwriting task, he will scream and fall to the floor to avoid or escape the task. Now, that's Joe's behavior. Andrew's behavior, as we saw, was similar but not exactly the same. I want you to notice that this hypothesis statement has three very important parts. First of all, every hypothesis statement should start with the word when. When we look at this hypothesis statement, it says Joe is asked to complete a handwriting task. That's the antecedent or the trigger that resulted in the problem behavior. The next part of the hypothesis statement says the student will, he or she will, or the student's name. Here we describe the behavior. I want you to notice that we're not using the word tantrum. Hopefully at this point in the webcast, you've forever stricken that word from your vocabulary. At this point, what you're saying, you're seeing is that the behavior here is screaming and falling to the floor. And so we want our behavioral description next. Finally, we have the words in order to. This is where we place our function in order to fall to the floor, excuse me, in order to escape the task. Now, when you see this hypothesis statement, sometimes teachers get confused and treat it as a goal statement. They, they sometimes write, when Andrew is asked to complete a handwriting task, he will complete the task in order to receive um, a point or a star on his sticker chart. This is, the hypothesis statement is not a goal. That's an incorrect use of this statement. This statement is a summary in one sentence of our assessment or analysis of the function, the, the function of the behavior that we're looking at. In Andrew's case, we would have two statements because we have two functions of behavior. Finally, we might want to describe some of the life circumstances that are impacting the student. And so we might have, after our sentences that describe the function of the behavior, we might have a sentence that describes where the student is in their life at this point. To close out Andrew's case, I have a hypothesis statement that I formulated for Andrew in relationship to his, quote, attention-seeking behavior. So our hypothesis for Andrew, based on our observation and collecting data, is this. When Andrew has his teacher's attention, and that, is, that attention is withdrawn, Andrew will run to other activities in the classroom and throw items in order to gain his teacher's attention.
And so in this case, we can see that the hypothesis is a quick summary of the assessment data that we've completed. Now, as I noted, that's not Andrew's only problem behavior. Um, he has another function to his behavior, and the next slide demonstrates that function. So again, we see that we begin with the same sequence, when, Andrew will, in order to. So when, he's asked to transition from a desired activity to a less desired activity, Andrew will sit without moving, run away, and throw items in order to avoid leaving the desired activity. So again, we see that Andrew's behavior was just not attention seeking. It also functioned to help him avoid or escape tasks. Again, we go back to the competing behavior model. And I want you to consider and maybe even sketch on a piece of paper nearby this competing behavior model because we now understand the antecedent to the escape motivated behavior is a, a demand that he engage in a task. The problem behavior is sitting, running, with it, running around the room, and throwing things. The function of the behavior is that he avoids the task. What would a direct replacement behavior be for this problem behavior that resulted in Andrew avoiding the task? Well, a direct replacement behavior would be to, to offer Andrew a choice and to say, do you want to do this now? And his answer might be no. You might offer Andrew um, the opportunity to ask for three more minutes of play, and he would then still avoid the problem behavior, or still avoid the task. And then uh, a third option would be to um, have Andrew put his schedule together and have him identify when he's going to do particular work and when he's going to play. So he has more control over his schedule. Now I know you're thinking right now, if I just let Andrew avoid his work, He'll never get work done and he'll never learn. So there is a desired behavior here. The desired behavior is having Andrew attempt the computer task. In order to make that an enticing option, we first have to teach Andrew to trust us. Right now, his behavior functions extremely well. It's a very highly efficient behavior. As soon as he throws the bean box and there are beans everywhere, he knows that he's going to delay doing the difficult task because he has to clean up the um, bean box. By teaching him to ask for a break, we've eliminated the length of time that he might have to um, delay engaging in the task. Now when we call him to the computer station to work on the computer, we probably have to also enhance the reinforcement available to him because he's really pretty adept at avoiding tasks. And so we want to make sure that when we ask him to come to the computer that um, there's, there's something in it for him. This is how the competing behavior model assists us in making the step from assessment into intervention. I want to take a moment to talk about data collection because when we're intervening with behaviors, we do have fairly significant challenges related to keeping track of the behaviors and assessing whether or not we're being effective. There are two types of data collection that we're actually collecting. The first is to assess the behavior. And I want you to notice that when I showed you the antecedent behavior consequence chart, that was pretty extensive. I would not suggest that you take that data every day. That data, that kind of rich, detailed data that shows me the situation in analog time is important for us to assess the function of behavior. But once we understand the function of the behavior, we should stop that type of data collection. So we should only collect that kind of data for about two weeks or until we understand the function of that behavior. To assess whether or not our intervention is successful and the behavior is decreasing, we want to collect a quicker form of data. The types of data we want to collect to assess whether or not our intervention is successful is called frequency, intensity, duration, and or location data. We want to know if the behavior is actually decreasing as a result of our intervention teaching the new skills that we identified in the competing behavior model. And so we want to get a quick snapshot of the frequency 
or the intensity of the behavior to assist us in understanding whether we're having a good impact. We want to graph this data so that we can keep track of the trend. And we want to collect this data as long as the intervention is in place. Here's an example of a graph that we might use to help us understand whether or not we're being effective. On the x-axis, wait, this is the x-axis. On the y-axis, we want to look at the measure of the behavior. And here I've noted FID, or frequency, intensity, and duration of the behavior. Let's imagine that we're counting the frequency of Andrew's throwing. And we estimate that per week there were 10 throwing episodes during our baseline. The, our baseline is the period before we start to intervene. Let's say that we have four weeks of data that tells us that Andrew's throwing behavior ranges between nine times to 12 times a week prior to an intervention. We, and during this time, we complete our assessment. We identify that Andrew throws things when he's trying to avoid a task. And so we begin to teach Andrew to ask for a break, to avoid tasks. And we see a very nice decrease where we go from a range of 9 to 12 times per week down to 5 to one time per week, and we can see that trend is down. So if we continue that intervention, we would expect that we might even get to zero. So that would be a good outcome for us. Now, sometimes something might happen. The teacher's out for a period of time. Um, there's a change in classroom. Andrew goes on to the next classroom, and they stop the intervention. So it's a return to baseline. When we see this kind of data, where we see higher rates of problem behavior, then we implement an intervention and the behavior decreases, then we remove that intervention and the behavior increases again, what that tells us is that our intervention was most likely effective in decreasing that problem behavior. If we saw this graph, we'd want to continue to do that intervention. And so it's important for us to collect this data to be able to report, using a graph, the success or to revise our plans based on the lack of success that we're having intervening with a problem behavior. A couple of tips, though, as we look at this kind of data collection. First, in real life, you don't have to return to baseline. If you have a successful intervention that is effective in decreasing a problem behavior, continue to do it. Don't return to baseline unless there's some reason outside of your control that requires that you do so or results in a return to baseline. Secondly, when you look at that graph, if you see three points with no change, you should review your strategy and ask yourself whether or not it's an effective strategy. Perhaps you may need to tweak your strategy a little bit. Definitely at five points with no change or the behavior is becoming worse, you should adjust or change your strategy or complete your assessment a second time. The final tip when it comes to data collection is Goldilocks. If you remember the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, everywhere she went, she encountered something that was too much or too little before she got to the just right amount. Well, we're going to use that Goldilocks rule, not too much, not too little, just right, when it comes to collecting data. It's possible to get overwhelmed with data and co to collect data constantly, so much so that you're not able to teach. But you want to be able to collect the just right amount of data, not so much that you can't be intervening and teaching, and not so little that you don't have a picture of the behavior, the just right amount. In order to help you with this, I have a sample data collection sheet that you might use for Andrew. In this sa sample data collection sheet, you begin with any episode of problem behavior that might occur with Andrew by noting the date that it, that it occurred, the start time of the behavior, and the end time of the behavior. Right away, I've got time. I've got the duration that a behavior occurred. Next, using circles, I'm going to go to my key at the top of the page, and I'm going to circle the numbers that describe the antecedents that were present. 
In this case, um, you can see that I have identified five antecedents that I know, a sixth might be unknown. I might not know what triggered the behavior. And then a seventh for another antecedent where I can write in the antecedent that um, occurred in the environment. The first five are direction or task, that would be the first one, denied access, that would be being told no when he wanted something, a transition between activities, Andrew is left alone, or attention is removed. And so by circling, with a, just simply with a pencil, I can very quickly note that in one, the very first behavior that we looked at, attention was removed from Andrew, and so he displayed a problem behavior as a result of that. Next, I want to note the behavior that occurred. Again, I'm going to be able to circle fairly easily. So number one is throwing items. Number two, taking clothes off. Number three, climbing on furniture. Number four, sitting when given a direction. And then there might be other behaviors that I need to describe. Again, by using circles, I can very quickly note the behaviors that occurred. Finally, I want to note the consequences that were used so that I could begin to assess whether or not there's a correlation between increased behavior with certain consequences. And in this case, um, the teacher used hand over hand prompting to help Andrew clean up. Now if you remember this episode from the chart that I showed you earlier, that very first episode was a behavior that functioned to achieve attention. When we give hand over hand prompting, we're giving attention. And so it could be that what you find out by collecting this data is that you are inadvertently reinforcing a problem behavior with the way you respond. This data collection helps you fill in the graphs that you're going to look at. The final thing that I want to talk about as it relates to data is data analysis. When we're reviewing the data, a good way to review it would be 6Ms. Let's say you encounter a period of time where you see three dots with no change or the behavior is getting worse. You want to ask yourself about these 6Ms. Um, to keep it consistent with the M theory, I've used gender specific terms. Uh, and please forgive me that. Um, it just makes it easier to remember if we talk about six M's versus um, six different um, characteristics. And so the first M is ma'am. This, this refers to the teacher. Is the teacher following the behavioral intervention with fidelity? Is the teacher implementing the behavioral intervention correctly is the question here. Or has something happened in the environment to cause the people interacting with Andrew to not implement the intervention well? If you see three dots in a row that haven't moved or are getting worse, you might ask yourself about that. Method. Does the method that you're using to intervene match the skill and the learning style of the student. I said earlier that Andrew is not a person who uses a lot of words. What if we decided in teaching a replacement behavior to teach him to say with his mouth, with his words, break? And, and we don't see a change in the behavior because he's trying to say a word that he's not really able to say. Instead we would use pictures or sign. And so that's where you want to look at your method. Machine. What if Andrew was a student who used an iPad to communicate? Um, what if he used an augmentative communication device and that device wasn't working? We might see an increase in the problem behavior because he's not able to communicate what he needs to communicate. Materials. Let's say we're teaching Andrew to ask for a break, but we're using a picture on the classroom board. That might not be an appropriate material to the task when he's sitting at a desk and, um, he, and we want him to demonstrate that new behavior of asking for a break. So you have to ask yourself, are the materials appropriate? If he's not making progress, it might be the materials that are inappropriate. Motivation. This relates to reinforcer. Remember when I said earlier that if we want to teach Andrew to attempt difficult work, we have to increase the reinforcement available to him. Maybe the reinforcer that we're using is not strong enough to entice him to attempt the work. And so we want to look at motivation. The final M in the six M's also is a gender specific term and this refers to mother nature.
There might be some event outside of your control that's influencing Andrew's behavior and resulting in him responding differently. And in this case, let's imagine that he was sick and suddenly you see a lot more behavior for a week or so related to him trying to avoid tasks. It might be that that behavior occurs because Andrew is sick and there's nothing you can do about that except to de decrease demands on him at that time. <clears throat> I have a number of graphs that I want to close with just to note that it's not always clear and easy to figure out what's going on. As you look at the graph before you right now, what you can see is that the intervention actually results in a worsening of the behavior. This is clearly a case where you do not want to consider the intervention and you, at, if you saw this data, you would want to go back and make sure to reassess the function of the behavior. This would be an indication that maybe you got something wrong in your assessment. It could also indicate that circumstances have changed pretty dramatically. This also shows a significant increase in the behavior that is probably most likely due to the intervention. In this case, you would not want to continue this intervention if you were attempting to decrease this problem behavior. This is an interesting case. As you look at this graph, what you see is that if these lines, called phase change lines, were not in the graph, this looks like if this were a continuous line, it would have continued to go down. In this case, you might conclude that the intervention really didn't have an effect. The behavior itself was on its way down because of something that Andrew was doing, separate from the intervention itself. In any case, if this is a behavior that you want to decrease, this is a good graph to see because that means you're on your way down. Finally, if you see this kind of graph, where you have a problem behavior, you implement an intervention, and then at the return to baseline, the behavior doesn't return, what you may conclude here is that you only needed that intervention for a short period of time and you don't need to con continue it. In closing, it's important that we define the behavior well. This is really how we're going to understand the function of the behavior. By observing that behavior in the environment, our first step there is the definition of the behavior. Secondly, I want to caution you. As we saw with Andrew, it's possible to have a behavior that means different things in different environments. So you're not looking for a 100% correlation between the behavior and a function. It's possible for behaviors to have multiple functions. So you have to look out for dual functions. I want to ha take a moment to talk about, quote, internally motivated behavior. I said earlier that this is rare that it's rare that we see behavior that it's, that's motivated by sensory functions. That behavior is frequently among the most difficult to um, assess because it occurs at all times. And if you were looking at your assessment data, you wouldn't necessarily see any correlation. You would see it occurring because, to escape tasks, occurring to seek attention, and occurring when the person is just left alone. When you see high rates of behavior that don't appear to be correlated to particular functions, that's when you really want to say to yourself, this might be an internally motivated behavior. Um, we didn't talk much about this in this webcast, but there is um, an, 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 a behavioral sequence that occurs where we talk about slow triggers or setting events. These are events that occur well before the behavior occurs and well before the antecedent that increase the possibility that the behavior will occur. I mentioned earlier that Andrew's teacher noted that she could tell that he had moods. Mood is an internal chemical process where your brain is responding differently and increases the probability of problem behavior. A lot of us, when we have bad mood days, we're more likely to maybe argue or be forgetful or speed or engage in other problem behavior. And so that mood is a setting event that increases the likelihood that a problem behavior would occur. On those kind of days, when you see mood or illness or change in schedule or some other slow triggers or setting events that are present, 
you may have to increase the intensity of reinforcement available or change your plan for the day. Finally, a word about um, teaching and collecting data. It's nearly impossible for you as a, as, an, as a person to teach while you're also collecting, particularly the intensive kind of behavior. Remember the chart that I showed on Andrew, which had every single event that occurred within about a five minute period of time? You can't teach and collect that kind of data. So you may need help from a school psychologist, a social worker, maybe a teacher mentor in your building, or someone else who could come in and assist you in observing while you're teaching. These kinds of assessments are, are difficult to do without that kind of support and help. Today's topic in the webcast was how to complete a function behavior, functional behavior assessment and how to begin to move from functional behavior assessment into intervention. In a future webcast, I will address how we develop interventions as a result of the hypothesis that we develop from the functional behavior assessment. Uh, and now I turn it over to Terry, who will describe the next webcast in our series. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you during the chat.